So I did another thing. Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. So as you can see from the title of the video, from the thumbnail that's probably gonna go up in the video, uh, I think it's a very sad day and some things that we gotta talk about, but I think the AMG is going away. So let's get into this and I'll tell you what's going on. All right, so while I think this is a sad day is because I absolutely, absolutely love this car. This is the most expensive car I've ever had. It's the fastest car I've ever had, nicest car I've ever had. Just everything about it is just amazing. Uh, I've never had carbon ceramic brakes before. Again, never have had this much horsepower or that much sound and torque and just, it's an amazing car. Just like it's been going on for the last three or four cars that I've owned, the market is just absolutely insane. And as we talked about before, when I was going to, or when I did refinance the RV, it's kind of like the same boat that we're in now. The AMG's price has just absolutely skyrocketed. And the reason why it's also kind of sad is because that car is no longer going to be made probably. Uh, the 4.0 V8 twin turbo is going to be going away. Everyone's going to be doing electric one day. So who knows? That could be a barn find one day in 50 years and it may be worth like 500 grand. I don't know. But it's sad to get rid of it when it's kind of like I'm playing the stock market early. I'm kind of like cashing in my chips before the real thing hits. So, uh, but who knows? I'm only going off of what other people say and there could be a potential bottom out with the market. Obviously right now inflation is at an all time high. Gas prices are at an all time high. So that vehicle may not be worth anything in a couple months as opposed to what it is now. So we're, we, we sold the, my Chevy ZR2 when we got the 2500. Uh, we actually made a couple grand on it. Same thing when Erin traded in her uh, Jeep or uh, GMC Terrain for the Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee. She made some money. And now here we are again that I could either sell that outright and take all the cash or I can buy the brand new car, trade that in, and uh, again, put a whole bunch of money in my pocket and uh, put it into the house build and the brand new car will just replace it and we've got something else uh, to use and go around and do stuff with. Now the new car, it's, it, it's, it's not anything to really slack on. Uh, I mean, that car there, brand new, was almost $170,000. It had about 503 horsepower, 500 and some foot-pounds of torque, and the new car that we're getting has an MSRP uh, of around 70 some thousand dollars, and it's coming with a 650 horsepower, 650 foot-pounds of torque. So that car is tuned, and it does have an exhaust on it, so it is modified to probably be closer to 600 horsepower, but, uh, that, and that's 600 horsepower at the wheels. So to get into something that's probably also gonna be pushing high 500s uh, at the wheel, it's not like we're really comparing a weaker car for another one, but uh, I don't know. I, I've never been in, a, I've only owned one Chevy in my life. I have not even been in the thing. The market again is just crazy. There's only two of these cars pretty much on the ground in the entire United States of America. Not to mention uh, if you order one, if a dealership can even get an allocation, you're looking at several months to a few years before you can even get your hands on one because they're all spoken for. So. Uh, I, I don't even know how the thing drives, don't even know how it's the fit and finish is gonna feel on the inside, but there's a $100,000 difference between this car and the one that I'm getting. So we just have to wait and see to go pick it up uh, on Monday. It is Friday right now. So we've got to finalize all the stuff with the bank and insurance and all that stuff. But uh, there soon will be a new car in the garage that uh, has a warranty. That's one of the biggest reasons why also I did it. Uh, only the transmission on this car right now has a warranty, and that's probably a $10,000 transmission, probably a $20,000 motor. 
So if anything happens to it, it's very expensive. I don't really want to take that thing to the racetrack and do track days on it uh, or do auto crossing or anything. Cause again, something breaks, I'm liable. It's all coming out of my pocket. And even though carbon ceramic brakes do officially kind of have a lifetime warranty or a lifetime time frame on them, meaning you can run those rotors for like 100,000 miles or more, uh, you start tracking those and they start going out very quickly. And those rotors right there are about three to $4,000 a piece. So we could be looking at like a $16,000 brake job on that car if I were to track it. And it just makes a lot more sense to get a car that uh, can be used on the track that is just a thousand times cheaper in every way. The motor is covered under warranty, the transmission, the shock suspension, the drivetrain, uh, the brakes and rotors are gonna be wear items on me, but you're looking at like a three or $400 rotor instead of a three or $4,000 rotor. So hopefully in future videos, the new car will be a really uh, iconic thing of the channel that we can do stuff to it. We can go to the racetrack. I can show you guys what drag racing is. I can show you guys what autocross is. I can show you what actual track days are. And then maybe a fourth thing, if I even get back into like time trials and we sign up for either NASA or SCCA and we register the car as a time trial car and we can do that too. So clearly not something for the channel with the house build. This will go into its own separate playlist that doesn't have to do with the house build. So everybody here, you can click on the playlist for the ICF house build to get updates on that. But then we can also have playlists for other fun stuff showing off uh, Aaron and I's hobby and stuff. And that'll be us actually going to racetracks or drag strips and stuff like that and actually having some fun for a car that's actually made for it. And again, full warranty with everything as long as you do exactly what they're supposed to do and what they're telling you to do. And when we get the new car back home, I will show you. There is track settings we have to do. There's oil changes that we have to put a special oil in it and a whole bunch of other stuff the things that we have to remove and like basically track prep the car so all coming up in future videos so today we just got to go pick up the check from the bank uh, I did go ahead and made sure that the trailer is all safe tires are pumped up uh, I did have a nail in one of the tires somewhere that I got to put in here but we plugged it put the new ones on there. I went and got new straps and everything. So we're not using these just regular kind of everyday straps. These are actually car straps. And I may actually be uh, bolting down some uh, D rings on here. So we have better hook points. Uh, and then we also got a thing of race ramps. So that way, if the AMG is too low, or if the new car is too low, uh, the ramps on here will sit on these six foot long race ramps and we have a nice long creep up onto the trailer so that we make everything safe and we don't scratch anything. So hang tight. We'll be back either today or uh, later in this video to when we actually go pick it up and we'll just see what happens from there. Well, we got to do an unboxing, right? I mean, we might as well. So if you look at the picture above right now, you will see that in the past, I have kind of just used wood to get cars up onto this uh, car trailer before, and it's an absolute nightmare. Not only is wood extremely heavy, but you need so many pieces staggered out so many in a thousand different ways. It was time that I said, screw it. I am not taking hundreds of pounds of uh, wood to racetracks anymore. We are gonna go ahead and get actual race ramps. And these things, these things are awesome. As you can see, they can support about 1,500 pounds. They're basically made of plastic and they weigh absolutely nothing. I mean, one-handed as opposed to trying to pick up uh, actual pieces of lumber that weigh hundreds of pounds. I mean, it is a huge pain in the butt to be transporting all of them stacked pieces like two by eights or two by tens and then loading those up into the truck. So to have something with actual handle and to have something that actually will just make life a thousand times easier for getting in and out of the truck or the trailer, these things are probably worth every single penny. All right, and last little thing, the great thing about being in Ohio, where I used to live, we have Summit Racing, like right there in town. And then if you guys have never heard of Jigs. Jigs. That's another kind of Summit Racing competitor. There's a few down here also in Ohio that is just awesome. You can go pick up stuff that day if you need it. So we got heavy duty axle straps. 
We got ones that actually lock in instead of the uh, ones, like I said, the other straps that we have. Those either have like little claw hooks that really don't hook onto a lot of things too easily. And then another one that's actually got like plates. The plates can't hook into anything except for one of the sides of the trailer. So they work, but they're not really good for car uh, hauling. So these ones here are 5,000 a piece. I believe that's more than the other ones that I have. Those are only 3,300 pounds a piece. And these actually hook in and lock in and they're a lot thinner that they can hook into everything. And then last, like I said, uh, we got D-rings that are rated at 11,000 pounds that we need to go get some grade eight uh, hardware that we can bolt down through here. And I can pretty much bolt it anywhere on that steel frame. And then we've got a D hook that's just a lot easier to hook into, especially with that type of hook. So I'll probably pull the AMG out, get it kind of prepared to see if that can even get up and on there. And then once it is up on there, we'll figure out where all the straps need to be and uh, where we might have to place some D hooks just for a better alignment and get everything a lot better situated. All right, so that's the setup that we're looking at right now. Don't know if it's gonna work until we actually try it out. The biggest problem is sometimes these need to get even a little bit higher before they touch the race ramps. So even though they've got these divots here, we might actually have to put it up on top to make these right here a little bit flatter. And then what I also did is I got my planer out and I took some of that lip down there for the dovetail because that can be an issue too. So we won't know until we see, especially because right there is really, really sharp. Sometimes we have to put some two buys going from there to there. So that way the wheels actually never touch the dovetail. You kind of like jump over top of this and get up a little bit easier. But I'm gonna wait until Aaron gets home because the front of the AMG is pretty long, not to mention it's got a really far sticking out carbon fiber piece like a front splitter so i would rather not drive up on that right now and hear a crunch versus her standing by and being like hey stop don't go up any further uh and we actually ruined this carbon fiber piece right here so it's definitely a hell of a lot taller than the other cars that i've had in the past on there again you guys saw the 370z race car trying to get up on there that was extremely low to the ground with a very long front splitter. This is more off of the ground, but a pretty far front splitter slash uh, to where the actual tire is versus where the actual front of the car is all the way up at that peak. So I'm, I'm gonna have to have a spotter before I do that. So we'll leave it there for now, wait for Aaron to get home, and then we'll give it a test run, and then we'll see if we can bolt down these D-rings somewhere and figure out uh, where they need to go, or don't use the D-rings at all, and we just use the trailer uh, factory hookup spots. All right, everybody, just got home from the bank, got the check, relatively smooth transaction, at least with the bank. The dealership's giving me a couple headaches uh, at first, because we're buying out of state, they wouldn't uh, sign a piece of paper that basically just says, we will give you the title in a timely manner, we'll make the bank the lien holder, and we'll make sure that we give you the correct title with the correct VIN and everything on it. And uh, I guess that's happened in the past with my bank. So they wanted to make sure that at least all that was done and there's a little bit of pushback there. And actually, we still don't even know what the dealership's gonna give us for the uh, trade-in. Now, I know what ballpark they're gonna give me for the trade-in because I told them several dealers have already offered me X amount of dollars for the trade-in. So I said, basically, you need to give me that or I'm gonna walk out. And uh, the fact that I'm paying MSRP for your car and this car is thousands under retail, you guys should have no problem giving me what I want for this car. You're gonna make a killing on this one and you're already making a killing on the new car because unfortunately, again, what's going on in this country is dealerships were adding tons and tons and tons of money over MSRP for market adjusting right now. And I've seen some Mercedes-Benz G-Wagons marked up as high as like $225,000 over the $225,000 sticker prices. That is just insane that there are people out there willing to pay double MSRP for a car when uh, it's not gonna be worth it in a few years. I mean, I don't know when all of this is gonna stop with COVID and Russia and everything like that and everything gets back on track, manufacturers start pumping out the numbers that they used to, but uh, to, to be locked into a car for even $10,000 over MSRP is just absolutely insane. I would never do it. This is gonna be like the 40th car that I've ever purchased uh, the third out of state 
and I have never paid MSRP. Uh, I may have gotten screwed on some used cars before where I paid retail value for the car, but uh, yeah, this is the first time new I'm ever paying MSRP. So as soon as I drive that car off the lot, it's no longer gonna be worth MSRP. It's probably not even gonna be worth invoice, which is probably five or $6,000 cheaper. So if I get in a wreck too, that's the other thing with insurance. How do you buy a car for $200,000 over MSRP and your insurance company will willingly pay you $200,000 over MSRP if you wreck it? I mean, you're just driving a bomb that could go off at any time and you're gonna completely get screwed. So uh, if anyone out there is willing to buy a car right now, um, the car that I'm getting is from Champion uh, Chevy in Howell, Michigan. They are a dealership that are willing to do MSRP at least. So they're abiding by kind of their bylaws with GM. They are not going over, which GM and Ford have been sending out some threatening letters uh, because the dealerships are allowed to sell for whatever they want to because they're their own private business. They can do what they want but they, they need to have like a gentleman's agreement that says you're not gonna screw my customers. And I think at this point, Ford and GM are pissed off. Um, you're giving us a bad rap. Mercedes Benz, you guys should be pissed off too. Uh, you should not make a car for $200,000 and then the dealerships say it's now worth 400 or it's we want 400. And then someone be like, screw Mercedes Benz, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go buy a Lexus or a BMW. Mercedes and everyone should be pissed off. And we actually have laws in effect that we're supposed to help out all this. The reason why we have dealerships is to protect the customer so that manufacturers can't run away with like a monopoly. Yet here we are now getting screwed by the dealership and hopefully maybe GM and Ford and everybody does step up and say, you know what, you charge people over MSRP, we told you not to, we're not giving you another brand new car, your dealership's gonna be forced to close. We'll give all those allocations to the dealership down the street who is willing to do MSRP and we'll make them a billion dollar dealership because they're gonna get all the sales now. So uh, it, it just blows my mind that, that dealerships can treat people like this and have that mindset to think they can get away with this. Especially again, when the government put the dealerships there, I think with whatever laws are put in place so that the manufacturers um, aren't the ones just setting the price and it is what it is and uh, there's no negotiation and blah, blah, blah. So, but again, now it's flipped and the dealerships are running away with these prices and uh, somebody 100% needs to step in and actually do something. Now, with that being said, I don't know how Tesla gets away with it. There are no Tesla dealerships. Uh, you just put your order in online and your Tesla gets delivered. So I'm not exactly sure, again, how they're getting away with that legally. But here we are now in a day of uh, a day and age of everything is purchased online and people are buying Teslas, getting them delivered, uh, Carvana, used cars online. They're just getting dropped off at your house. You don't test drive them. It's just, you know, here it is. Here's your brand new car showing up at your doorstep. And yet Tesla is now worth almost a trillion dollars, which is bigger than every other manufacturer in the world, I think combined. I think second place may be like uh, Toyota and they may only be worth like a hundred and some billion dollars. Tesla is worth almost a trillion. They could buy Toyota, Mercedes, GM, Ford combined. So clearly Tesla is doing something right. Yes, they have a different product out there, but uh, for people to not have to go with this whole crap salesman negotiation crap, that just they, they put money down, they go to their bank, they wire a check to Tesla, and then a few months later, their brand new car shows up at their doorstep. It just seems like a so much better process than the headache and the gut-wrenching uh, negotiating and arguing with dealerships, especially on trade-ins and what you're gonna get the new car for or a used car, I, I, I'm just done with it. I, I, I really wish um, dealerships would just go away and their service centers would remain so that you can still you know, take a Mercedes-Benz into someone who knows how to work on them. Um, but the whole dealership selling side, gone. Uh, do everything online, get rid of the dealerships, and just have it at that for the rest of the time. Now, I'm sure someone's gonna ask in the comments, Scott, why the hell are you trading this in? Very easy. In Ohio, we get to pay less taxes if we trade something in for something new. You don't get tax savings if you use for used, 
but this car is worth more right now than the brand new car that I'm getting at full MSRP, even with taxes added on if I weren't trading something in. So I don't have to pay one red cent to taxes because I'm trading this in. So what the dealership is giving me, if I were to sell this on my own, I would have to get over $5,000 more uh, by selling this outright than I could uh, by trading it in, and that would only match the dealership. I don't have to worry about any tire kickers, not to mention I don't wanna do all that anyway. Selling to somebody and having tire kickers and talking to them for weeks straight, waiting on them to come into town, um, get money and title and all that stuff together, it's just a huge pain in the butt. So not only uh, would we have the dealership's price here, then what I'm actually getting from the dealership because I'm getting all that tax savings, I would want an additional like thousands of dollars to sell this to Joe Schmo on the street because I'm working for it. I'm now the salesman and I want a commission for it. So I, I need to get even more money for that and it's just not worth it. I can save on the tax, sign this over to the dealership and just be freaking done with it. And I think I get a pretty good deal on it. Cause again, I'm getting like a free, like $5,000 more on top of this car because I don't have to pay taxes on the new one. So that's why I'm doing it. I think it's really easy in this situation. Every situation is gonna be different when you're buying a car. But uh, if you are in Ohio or in, you're in, if you're in another state, check your laws. If, if you're looking for a brand new car and you know, Think about that. Uh, if you're trying to sell this car on your own and the dealership lowballs you, you need to add your taxes back onto that and then it doesn't seem as much as a lowball because you're getting that free money. So check your laws where you live and uh, uh, you know go about that route if it suits you. Okay, so I think that is enough for today. Uh, we'll wait on Aaron to get home. It did start to rain and it's gonna get pretty cold here. So we may not load it up on the trailer today. May have to wait till tomorrow or Saturday or Sunday. But uh, yeah, I will see you guys back probably Monday morning when we're on our way up. And uh, fingers crossed, everything goes smoothly with them also. All right, everybody, Aaron and I got the AMG up onto the trailer. Uh, getting it up on the trailer was super easy. There, there's so much room with a factory height, uh, it's not even funny. Again, I'm used to the 370Z being slammed on the ground and uh, that front lip being so far out. But it was absolutely no problem getting it up on there. I did just have to figure out what ball and hitch mount I want to use. I've got two different kinds. One is only rated at like 5,000 pounds. And then this hitch over here is rated at like 16,000 pounds. Instead of it being hollow steel, it's a solid chunk of steel with a 12,000 pound ball on it. And unfortunately, we did just have to bust out this leg uh, of this forklift because I needed something long enough to give me some torque to go onto one of my wrenches. Um, we had the ball was flipped upside down so the hitch was like an inch and a half in elevation so we could move the trailer around but now I need an inch and a half of drop so I had to flip it around and move the ball so we were able to get that done it still looks like as we're standing right here though we're kind of going down the street like this so we'll have to play with it and bring the other hitch with us just in case but uh, I think it'll be okay but strap wise not 100% the way I wanted to do it. I like crisscrossing my straps, but with the car having a complete flat bottom, it was not easy to do that. We couldn't uh, cross them. So we just got two in the rear and two in the front. So we did use our new axle straps or they're actually locked kind of down and around uh, the lower control arms, but that gave us some room over here. I'm not a huge fan. Just hooked in right here like that. Uh, again, we probably should use some uh, more D-rings over here, but uh, we'll worry about that when we're taking the new car to the track. I'll get them drilled out. And then the front, we'll see how these play out too. We're attached around the lower control arms, and then we're kind of draped over here and locked into a hole on the bottom of this. So uh, it's just got basically a good angle instead of having to put the D-rings on right now, which would be kind of going right here and straight on. But we'll drive down the street for a little bit when we get gas in the morning and see how that plays out. And then uh, I guess I will see you guys back in the morning or see you guys at the dealership. And fingers crossed it all goes well. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can see me well enough. It's still kind of dark out, but I'm sure the camera is adding a lot more light. Uh, I waited till the sun was at least kind of hitting the horizon because I had to check all the straps, make sure everything is tied down tight. 
Uh, we're about to be at the first gas station so that we can fill up and luckily it's not too far away. We've got about a three hour drive so I'm just super lucky that I was able to find a car that a dealership already purchased. It was 91 days to the dealership from the date of order. I found it, put money down, was expecting three months more before it showed up, and then all of a sudden, boom, here it is. It shows up and I gotta do all this and come get it just within like three or four days. So, pretty crazy that I got that lucky while other people are waiting six, nine months and they still don't even have their car delivered yet. But uh, the only thing that's scaring me about this is the straps. I did have a fault one time with one of my straps, not while hauling a car, but I took down a tree on the property with one of the straps, with one of those like claw foot adapter things, and I was using a come along, took down a tree, took the come along down, took the hook out, and the strap was laying on the ground, and like a minute later, I heard this loud ping just like you'd hear like an M1 Garand discharging its last round and kicking out that metal clip. That's exactly what I heard. I was like, what the heck was that? I go over, the hook literally just exploded. So I don't know if it was because it was freezing outside and it had a lot of tension on it when it was pulling the tree over as I was kind of using the come along to lean it to one side. But with the, all of the tension off of that strap, again, like five minutes later you just hear a ping and the thing exploded so it's cold out right now at 36 degrees the straps are extremely tight I'm just really hoping we don't have a failure like that and that was like one in a million so uh, yeah we got a three-hour trip hopefully everything goes smoothly and nothing bad happens but we do have extra straps and stuff if need be and uh, we'll see how well it goes Truck's doing great, 2,500. Don't even feel like it's back there. And the beauty of the trailer with trailer brakes, set the gain all the way to 10. You go ahead and tap these brakes. You don't even know anything's back there. Four hours after arriving at the dealership, I am finally on my way home and gonna feed myself with some disgusting McDonald's. But oh my God, this is why people hate dealerships. I understand being out of state, there's a little bit of an issue with, uh, I guess uh, my salesman had never seen a car not have to pay tax before. And again, because I'm from Ohio and I'm up in Michigan, I'm trading in a more expensive car than a cheaper new car. I don't have to pay any sales tax. So it threw all of their numbers and stuff into a frenzy and they had to call their DMV and make sure I'm leaving with the correct paperwork. Like I'm almost leaving with the title, even though I'm getting a bank loan on this, uh, pretty much I can like title this thing right now and uh, not have to give it to my bank. So that would obviously be a bad thing, but um, it just threw everything into a frenzy and uh, they renegotiated or they negotiated the trade for the, the AMG and um, I knew they were going to because they gave me a ballpark figure, which of course they decided to hit me in the middle of it. Not happy about it. On the flip side, there were some things about the AMG that I didn't know until I was loading it yesterday, and that kind of scared me. Um, nothing detrimental or bad. They're still getting a good deal. Um, there was a scratch on the lower rocker panel where a tire must have gotten kicked up and went kind of like underneath of the car, but all the way down and underneath one of the doors. And it was a scratch about that long. I've never seen that before, but uh, it was through the blue paint, and I think that rocker panel is made of plastic, so you could see like white plastic. So nothing that's bad, you can just fill it in with some touch-up paint. But Mercedes did not put any extra sort of like rock guard, heavy duty paint along there. It's like actually smooth paint. So very easy to scratch, obviously. So uh, that was one thing that I guess, you know, I, the car wasn't in pristine order that I had said it was, where I thought I was gonna get, you know, top dollar for it and then the other thing is I actually found a few drips of oil on my garage floor why do I have drips of oil on my garage floor I looked it up it, apparently it's a very common thing the rear main seal of the engine is leaking probably being because the car sits so long you fire it up uh, the real main seal isn't lubed a hundred percent because the oil has been sitting for several months and then it like throws out a drop of oil and, uh, it may be having the rear main seal go bad. 
Mercedes-Benz, as far as I can tell, says that as long as it's not like drip, 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 you're fine. A drip every like six months isn't going to hurt it, and that's really all I saw on the ground. Um, I don't have any actual liquid oil. You can just see that the rear main seal and where the transmission come together on the bell housing, it was moist. But again, no actual uh, oil leakage. So pretty much for any rear main seal, let it go until it's actually like profusely leaking on the ground. So again, something that I didn't know, not something detrimental to the car. It's about a hundred dollar seal, but you're probably looking at a thousand dollars to have the seal replaced in labor. So I figure they can go ahead and knock off a thousand dollars off of the uh, price that I had in my head and they're still going to end up with a good deal and I'm ending up with a good deal because again, used for new, I'm saving like $5,500 in taxes. So I'm going to eat real quick before we uh, actually make it home. Uh, I'm going to do a review probably in another video. Um, and I'll show you at least what I got when I get home. But we'll do a review, go over all the bells and whistles and uh, in a part two or continuing with this series. And uh, we'll just go from there. But for right now, I'm just hungry and I want to get the hell out of Michigan and get back to Ohio. Oh my God, almost 12 hours on the road and at the dealer. But we are finally back home. So 30 minutes into this video, at least you guys already knew what we were getting from the title and the uh, thumbnail. We got a 2022 Camaro ZL1 1LE. So before the sun goes down, I just want to go over everything real quick and we'll do a full in-depth review later. But what the heck does all that mean? Well, first off, the ZL1 package stands for, this is the big boy. This is a 6.2 liter V8 supercharged with what they call an LT4 supercharger, pushing out again 650 horsepower, 650 foot pounds of torque. So we're going from an AMG that has a little four liter V8 twin turbo to a 6.2 liter LS direct injected uh, V8 pushing out that much power. So that's what the ZL1 indicates, but the 1LE basically stands for this car is ready for the track. So what you get over the standard uh, ZL1 in the 1LE package is basically just everything to get this thing onto a track. You've got a completely different front bumper that lets in just tons of massive amounts of air into 11 heat exchangers on this thing. There's five right here alone. Again, we'll go over all this stuff tomorrow, but you get huge dive planes, a huge front splitter already, you get a carbon fiber uh, wing, you get massive wheels and tires that are pretty much slicks already, uh, braking packages, um, upgraded, or uh, I don't know if they're upgraded, but at least they're blacked out side skirts, black mirrors, matte black hood, uh, the carbon fiber hood scoop is already on the ZL1 packages, but just so many indications that already tell you that this is not just a typical a ZL1. Uh, I believe the taillights are also included. So on a regular ZL1, you get red taillights as opposed to these smoked out ones on the 1LE package. Uh, upgraded suspension, upgraded brakes, wheels, tires, aero package, pretty much everything ready to have this thing on the track. So again, I'll tell you guys all about what the differences are uh, probably on a video tomorrow, but I just want to go ahead and get out one tonight before the sun sets. And uh, uh, yeah, if I don't post enough, YouTube absolutely kills me. We go from awesome amount of views to almost no views, like we're a channel that's just non-existent. So we need those thumbs up. We we need to be posting two or three times a week or else YouTube just forgets about us and uh, doesn't matter what our content is. So uh, just wanted to get this thing out to you guys tonight. I finally made it home. I'm going to get some sleep. I'm going to get some dinner. And then tomorrow we'll go out and have to put miles on it because I have not even driven the thing. It's got six miles on it. It went from the dealer's parking lot up onto the trailer and that's it. So I've started it up only once. So you guys will get an actual review first time with me in it tomorrow. And uh, we'll just see how it goes from there. But again, we upgraded a car. We're putting tons of money in our pocket for the house build and uh, everything is under warranty. So I can pretty much just beat the crap out of this when we go ahead and do the track prepping that uh, again, that'll probably be in another video. 
because um, there's several things that we have to do to get this thing ready to actually go onto a track. And we actually have to put about 2,500 miles on it. So we actually have to use and abuse this thing a little bit before we can actually go full bore uh, on a track. But at least for tonight, it is home safe. It's not 100% what I would have wanted. Uh, I am missing the data uh, uh, performance data package, which gives you a camera and then it shows over top of everything that you're doing on the track, like RPM and gear and speed and brake pressure and throttle pressure and all that stuff. So um, didn't get that, but like I said, there's only like two in the country, so you kind of get what you can get. And uh, I probably would have changed the color too. Let me know what you guys think about the white. Is it cool to have two white vehicles and do the black accents, make the white look good enough? Or should I maybe have held out for a black or maybe a found one that was in like a gunmetal gray or something? But I'm gonna wrap this video up here, guys. Again, I'm tired. I'll see you guys next time. Hit the thumbs up if you like it. Want to see more. Can't wait to see more. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow. So until then, take care. And I'll see you all next time.